I guess that's my problem, man. What's that? I said, I guess that's my problem, man. I can't sound good because I don't look good. No. Oh, yeah. Well, Good morning, Northside. Morning. All right, hold on. That was like three of us. Can we do that again? Good morning, Northside. Good morning. All right. If you guys would, go ahead and stand. We're going to do something a little bit different this morning. We're going to start off with an Old Testament reading. We're going to be reading out of Psalm 103. It says, Let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart, I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord gives righteousness and justice to all who are treated unfairly. He revealed his character to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. He will not cons constantly accuse us, nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. For he knows how weak we are. He remembers we are only dust. Our days on earth are like grass, like wildflowers. We bloom and die. The wind blows and we are gone, as though we had never been here. But the love of the Lord remains forever with those who fear him. His salvation extends to the children's children of those that are or who are faithful to his covenant, of those who obey his commandments. The Lord has made the heavens his throne. From there he rules over everything. Praise the Lord, you angels, you mighty ones who carry out his plans, listening for each of his commands. Yes, praise the Lord, you armies of angels who serve him and do his will. Praise the Lord, everything he has created, everything in all his kingdom. Let all that I am praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah.
Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for the blessing to be able to come and worship you this morning. God, we thank you for your presence here in this room. We thank you for your Holy Spirit as it um, inhabits the praises, Lord, of your people here this morning. We pray that we might just continue to worship you in spirit and truth, just as your word tells us to do, Lord. Thank you for blessing us with another day and, again, an opportunity to have fellowship with one another and to come into this place and worship you. Lord, we thank you for this church and the people in it. God, just continue to bless the service, and uh, we thank you for your presence here. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Would you be seated? Good morning. I'm Dan. I'm one of the pastors here at Northside. Um, so great to see all of you here uh, in person here this morning. Uh, we also have a lot of people watching online. I just took a peek and we saw we had check-ins from Missouri, uh, Philadelphia, Carolina Beach. And so it's great to, to, for you all to be joining us as well. Uh, our, our streaming ministry is incredible as it allows folks traveling as well as those checking out Northside from near and far. So we're glad that everyone is with us. Um, I want to put a few things on your radar screen as uh, we think about what the next couple of weeks look like in the life of the church. The first one is our baptism class, and that's going to be on Sunday, November 10th. So if you've been considering baptism as a sort of the next step in your faith, a way to uh, enter the waters of baptism following Jesus's example, um, that's an opportunity for you to do that. Um, the baptism class will be a little bit later uh, in the month, but the, uh, I'm sorry, the baptism service will be a little bit later in the month, but the class will be on Sunday, November 10th at 4 p.m. Details are there in your bulletin. We want you to connect with Pastor Adrian if that's something that you're interested in. Uh, so you might have 
little bit about a children's ministry center that we've been working on. And uh, so the groundbreaking has been scheduled for Sunday, November 17th at 3 p.m., which is incredible. We praise God to, that he's brought us to this point. We also want to remind you at 7 p.m. tonight, there's a special called congregation. Called Northside Home, we really, really, really encourage you to be here uh, to hear from Pastor Adrian and our church leadership to just about the, the journey that we've been on with this uh, groundbreak or with this children's ministry center that led us to the point of being able to even schedule a groundbreaking. Really excited to catch you up on those details, uh, be able to answer questions, and just to share the vision of how God um, has led uh, our leadership to this point. So, again, we hope you'll join us tonight at 7 p.m. Child care is available. Just give D or I a heads up if you need it. And again, make sure you put on your calendar Sunday, November 17th at 3 p.m. for the groundbreaking. And finally, Operation Christmas Child. We saw so many of those boxes leaving last week and so many even coming back in this morning. Um, we've got two more weeks to fill those boxes. So if you see some empty ones still out there as you're leaving, if you could grab one or two and really bless a child here on Christmas. Um, and if you've taken some of those boxes, please be sure to bring those back on November 17th. So is it good to be gathered in the house of the Lord today? It's so great to see all of you. I want to mention real quick, the Connect card is right in front of you. Excellent way if you're new here to share a little bit about you. If you're not new here, just another great way to connect with us, get plugged into different ministries, share prayer concerns, update your contact information. So please check that out. Drop it in the offering box uh, on your way out if that's something that uh, you wanted to fill out and let us know. If you take a moment, just greet each other in the name of the Lord. Our worship team will call us back together here in just a moment. We're so glad that you're here. Church, your joy is mine. Your joy is mine. Yet why am I fine with all my I want 
Our New Testament reading comes from Luke. Then turning to his disciples, Jesus said, That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food to eat or enough clothes to wear. For life is more than food, and your body more than clothing. Look at the ravens. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for God feeds them. And you are far more valuable to him than any birds. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And if worry can't accomplish a little thing like that, what's the use of worrying over bigger things? Look at the lilies and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for flowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? And don't be concerned about what to eat and what to drink. Don't worry about such things. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers all over the world. But your Father already knows your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and he will give you everything you need. The word of God for us, the people of God. There's a space in every beating heart There's a longing that reaches past the stars And there's an answer to every question mark and There's a name and There's a hope flowing through these veins and there's a voice that echoes through the pain and there's an ember ready for the flame and there's a name and we will fix our eyes on the one who
With this heart, with this heart, open wide from the depths, from the heights, I will bring a sacrifice. With these hands, with these hands, lifted high, hear my song, hear my cry, I will bring. Sacrifice. I will bring a sacrifice. Time lay me down, I'm not my own. I belong to you alone. Lay me down, lay me down. is true. There's no life apart from you. Lay me down, lay me down. Lay me down, lay me down. Let him go, let him go of my pride, giving up all my rights. Take this life. And let it shine. Take this life. Take, Take this life. life. And let it shine. Now lay me down. I'm not my own. I belong to you alone. Lay me down. Lay me down.
Sing it out, church. It will be my joy. It will be my joy to say your will, your way. It will be my joy to say your will, your way. It will be my joy to say your will, your way, always. It will be my joy. It will be my joy to say your will, your way. It will be my joy to say. My joy to say your will, your way, always. I'll lay me down. I'll lay me down. I'm not my own. I belong to you alone. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to, to sing praises to you today, to lift your name on high. Father, to, to have the opportunity to lay our life down in pursuit of you. Lord, help us to realize that when we do that, we gain so much. And we find life that is truly life. And Lord, as we spend time together today in your word, we do so as, as people of hope. Lord, we also at the same time are, are people who have needs in our life. Lord, as a congregation, we, we certainly recognize the individuals in our community who are, who are hurting and, and suffering today. Lord, we continue to lift up Chris and, and Esther Simpson to you. Father, we pray for Heather and, and Carl and Maggie and the family. Lord, we pray for your comfort and peace to be with them. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to join the church worldwide today in proclaiming you as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Father, as we spend time looking at your word, may you open our hearts. May you help us to see what it is that you have for each and every one of us today. For it is in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. As the worship team is making their way down, we're going to spend some time in 1 John this morning. 1 John chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 12 through 17. As you find that, I'm going to invite Melissa Brown to come and to read this passage of Scripture for us. I am writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God lives in you, and you will have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or anything in the world. For if anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the, and the pride of life comes not from the Father but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. The word of God for us, the people of God. Ah! Yeah. <laughs> I think it goes something like this. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Melissa. It is good to see you guys this morning. If you are new to Northside, 
one of the things that I, I want you to know is we're picking up this series, uh, looking at what does it mean to be hungry for God? What does it mean to, to pursue God above everything else? Because this life presents us a lot of opportunities to be hungry for different things. You and I have met people who are hungry for, for notoriety. You've met people, no doubt, who are hungry for status, hungry for money, appetites for pleasure, appetites for, for fame. There's all kinds of things in life that, that we develop appetites for. And, and I shared with you several months ago, having lunch with a, a person here at Northside who just really laid out for me how hungry they were for God. It seemed to consume them, so much so that, that every part of our conversation seemed to go back to this desire, I want to know God more. I want to spend more time in the Bible. I want to spend more time praying. I want to spend more time thinking about how God is working in my life and seeing Him work and move in my life. So often, I, I think I get invited to conversations to provide counsel or encouragement. And that was a conversation I left being challenged in my walk with the Lord. And when you look at passages like 1 John, 1 John is, is written to a group of believers who are two to three generations removed from physically seeing Jesus Christ. The uh, first generation has died off. John the Elder, who is acclaimed for having written 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, is one of the last living apostles to have seen, physically seen, Jesus Christ. And so he's writing to this second and third generation of believers who the further they get removed from Christ are beginning to question some of the tenets of faith that their parents and their grandparents have passed on to them. We talked about how if you want to go deeper in your faith, you have to first come to the recognition of do you believe who Jesus says he is? Do you really believe that he existed? Do you really believe that he died on the cross? Do you really believe that he rose on the third day? Do you really believe that he's coming back? Because that is the starting point for all things in faith. If you have trouble believing that, it's going to be really hard for you to move and to grow in your relationship with the Lord. John is laying that down as the foundation. The next week, we talked about how do you identify a Christian? There's a lot of people in this world who claim to be Christians. And yet John is saying there, there seems to be this litmus test. And, and if you will, it, it really comprises three tests. The first is a, a doctrinal test. What do you believe about God? The, the second is what we would call an ethical test. What do you do with your life? How do you behave? How do you live out your life? The third is a relational test. Who do you love? Do you love the people that God says to love? And we talked about these two lines. One was a, a vertical line. One was a horizontal line. And the horizontal line is, is from the beginning, you have no knowledge of God. And as you progress, you come to a knowledge of God. The vertical line was one where you don't pursue holiness at all. And as you grow and as you move, you begin to pursue holiness. And John seems to be saying that as we get to know God more and as we become more holy, that's where you find the life of a believer, that there's growth on two fronts. Last week we talked about sin and how we don't like to use that word a lot. We like to think of it as mistakes. We like to think of it as learnings. We don't like to look at our mistakes and our failures as sin. And John is saying that you and I, we have to get real about that because if we're not real about sin in our life, then it's really going to make it a, a, a jump to realize that we need a Savior. If everything can be excused, if everything can be explained away, then what need is there for, for Jesus Christ? And then he pivots and, and comes to this second chapter, and he makes this statement, do not love the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So here's the question I pose to some people this week. If I love God, do I really have to hate the world? Think about that for a minute. How would you answer that question? If I love God, do I really have to hate the world? I reached out to Margie and reached out to Dan. Margie, how would you answer that? Do I really have to hate the world if I'm going to love God? Okay, thank you. Dean? What she said? Uh, <laughs> I think that when you think about the world, is, is, are you thinking of the physical place? People might say, you know, 
uh, or are we thinking about the people in it, but I think that it comes out more about the sin that's in the world and ultimately that, because for thousands of years, sin has obviously become the problem, you've been the problem that changes through generations, but it's still a problem associated with sin, I think. Yeah. You know, and listening to Margie and Dan share and thinking about this question, I imagine we would have maybe similar responses, maybe different responses if we went around. But Christians seem to have this love-hate relationship with the world. I mean, on one hand, Margie referenced it. You have the most famous passage in Scripture, John 3, 16, that tells us what? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. On the other hand, you have passages like John where John says not to love the world or anything in the world, that all of the pleasures of the world are, are to be cast aside. So the, the question is, should you and I really forsake all the worldly pleasures? Should we just bottle them up and say, well, I'm not going to pursue any of those? I, I shared with you before, my brother and I grew up at a, a Christian school, and the Christian school that we went to really did a pretty good job of, of painting the world as all negative. So much so that, that there were a lot of things that were forbidden for us to do. We had to sign a contract when we got into high school that we wouldn't go to movies or concerts, that we wouldn't be with the opposite sex and very private situations, that we wouldn't listen to certain kinds of music, that we wouldn't dance, that we wouldn't do all of these different things. Because in their mind, in their perspective, those were all worldly pleasures. Those were all things that were, were of this world. And, and if you open the door to them, then you were going down a road that a lot of people didn't return from. Graduated from high school and went on to college and met a lot of people who listened to kinds of music that I hadn't heard before spent the night with people of the opposite sex, let alone being alone with them, went to movies, certainly danced. And I'll confess to you, there was a moment in time, at least in my life, where, where I looked at that and thought, you know, that life looks pretty fun. I mean, compared to, to what I had experienced, compared to what I had known, looking at that and thinking, you know, is, is that really what they were trying to keep us away from? Is that really what they were trying to do? Am I really supposed to forsake all those other pleasures in my life? I think when you look at passages like John, I think there's a lot to dive into. Remember, we've talked about John having this kind of cyclical approach. He'll say something, and then he will expound on it, and then he's going to come back to it again and take us a little bit deeper each time. So when you read 1 John, as Melissa read it for us, I think you can sum up what he's writing in verses 12 through 17 with one word. And the word is desire. What, what is your desire in life? What are what your passions in life for? Or, or is there a desire to want to know God more? Is there a desire to want to grow closer to him? It's one thing to, to recognize who Jesus is. It's another thing to recognize what a believer is. And it's an entirely another thing to recognize what sin is. But what about desire for God? John's writing this letter, and he takes this, this change, if you will, and adds what I would call a very pastoral touch to his letter. He starts it with a lot of commands. He starts with a lot of statements that are very hard to hear. But then he shifts, and he begins it this way. Really what I think is a pretty curious way to begin it. I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. He then moves to talk about fathers, and then he talks about young men, and there's a variety of interpretations as to what's going on here, but there's a lot of commentators who come to the conclusion that what John is doing is that he's been really hard on them in the first chapter, and in the second chapter, he's gathering everyone around, and he's just reminding them of how much he loves them, how much he cares for them, how proud he is of them. It's like the dad or the coach getting you alone and saying, listen, I, I need you to know something. I need you to know, number one, how proud we are of you. I need you to know that we really are thankful for how hard you're working. And, and you need to know that we're behind you. And you need to know something else. And John's getting ready to lay out what that something else is. The something else for him is do not love the world. He brings up these, these three groups of people, and, and you might be quick to write it off and say, well, because I'm not a young man, this verse don't apply to me, or because I'm not an older person or an older man, or because I'm not a, a child. Yet what John is referencing here literally are three stages of spiritual growth. 
You have people who are young children in their walk with the Lord. They're new to the faith. They are passionate about it. They can't get enough of the Bible. They can't hear enough Christian music. They can't read enough devotionals each and every day to, to fill the appetite that they have for God. John's writing to that group of people. He's writing to young men, these people who are hitting their stride in their walk with the Lord. They're, they are people who have walked with the Lord for a while, and now they are people of influence. They are people of status. They are people of stature. Individuals are coming to them because they see the passion and the energy in them. And then he writes to the older men, the, the wise people, the people for whom the energy may not necessarily be front and center, but they are the people you choose when you need answers to your problems. They are the individuals you go to seeking out wisdom and guidance. John's writing to these three groups, and certainly those groups are represented here this morning, aren't they? You've got people who are new to the faith. They're passionate. They're excited. You've got people who are hitting their stride in their walk with the Lord. They feel solid about what they know. They feel solid about sharing their faith. And you've got those who have walked with the Lord for a long time. They're the seasoned saints, if you will. They're the individuals for whom wisdom and, and discernment are spiritual gifts in their life. And John's making an assumption about those three groups. He's making the assumption that no matter where you are, you are still wanting to grow in your relationship with the Lord. If you're young, you're wanting to grow. If you're in that place of feeling pretty solid about your relationship with God, you want to grow. If you're at that place where you feel like, I've read the Bible 30 times, cover to cover, I know what I need to know, John is still saying, I know you want to grow in your relationship with God. He has something very important to say to us, and, it, and it's this. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. It's a very stern warning. John is, is giving what's called an imperative mood, if you will. Fifteen times in 1 John, he makes a statement about do not. Now, that might seem like a lot, but when you take a book like James, who has just as many chapters, over 40 times in the book of James is an imperative command given. Do not do this. So John, in many ways, doesn't really approach that do not command very often. But he is so explicitly clear about do not love the world or love anything in the world. So the question for us is what does he mean by the world? What is the world? Well, in Greek, the, the word for the world is actually a word that may sound very familiar to you. It's the word cosmos. And the idea was that it had two variations. One meant the literal created order, human beings, creation, all the things that, that work, the sun rising, the sun setting, the moon coming up. When the Bible speaks of the world, at times it speaks of God's created order. And it doesn't take much to look in Scripture and see that God called creation what? Good. Not only that, he called it very good. So it's not you and I that, that I think John is getting that here. It's not the creation or the created order that John is saying, look, this is what you're supposed to despise. The other variation for the word cosmos in Scripture were the worldly values, the things that the world embraced, the wisdom of the world, the integrity of the world, the lifestyles of the world. And John is saying, that's what I'm talking about. Don't love that perspective of the world. The world is going to show you a lot of different ways in which to live. Don't, don't love it. Don't fall in love with it. In fact, John would use this word later in chapter 4, verse 3, when he talks about the Antichrist who is in the world. He says, this is the spirit of the Antichrist which you have heard is coming and is even now already in the world. What does he mean there? He means that the world's values have already been impaired by this person who stands opposite of Christ. The world's system of beliefs has already been inflicted with the Antichrist. He goes on to say this in chapter 5, the whole world is under control of the evil one. Meaning that the idea of the world's values are not, we don't look at the world's values to find Jesus Christ, do we? We don't look at the world's standards to say that is how a Christian should live. If you want a better picture of it, think of the reputation of a place like Las Vegas and, and what Las Vegas historically has represented, or Chapel Hill for that matter, what has historically <laughs> represented for a lot of people. We'll stick with Las Vegas. I, I think that that probably sums up a lot of the world's perspective of life, that what happens here stays here. 
and you can find anything you want there. John is saying that, that's, that's the world. And, and the spirit of the Antichrist is, is in the world. The whole world is, is under his control. Why is John saying this? Why is he saying you cannot love the world and, and love God at the same time? Well, he's echoing a lot of the same teachings that Jesus gave when Jesus was physically present. But I think what John's getting at is that there are a system of values and convictions that every single one of us will latch on to in life. We will latch on to the world's system of values and beliefs, or we will look to Scripture, look to Christ, and we will latch on Christ's system of values and beliefs. You, you can't balance one or the other, and, and so many people do. And maybe, maybe you found yourself trying to balance, on one hand, wanting to be in the world and to embrace some of the pleasures of the world, and on the other hand, getting up on Sunday morning and coming to church. But it's like trying to, to keep a foot in the canoe and a foot on the dock at the same time. They are going to separate from one another, and at some point, you're going to have to jump. You're going to have to make a decision on, am I, am I going to be in this boat or am I going to be on this dock? That's what John's trying to get his readers to understand. I think the challenge for, for us is knowing, how do I know if I'm living in the world? I mean, is it as clear as, as growing up one way and being told you can't do certain things and then going and seeing it in a different light? Is, is that what it means to be in the world? Is it, is it on one hand having these, these desires in my life and and giving in to them at times, and, and yet coming back and professing my love for God. Is that what does it mean to be in the world? Thankfully, John gives us some, some clarity on what he's talking about in 1 John. He talks about the love for the world, and then he, he quantifies it by, by making this statement. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. And he comes alongside that with these three desires, if you will. He says, for everything in the world, the cravings of sinful people, the lust of their eyes, the boasting about what they have and do, comes not from the Father, but from the world. There's a lot of ways to translate that. I love the King James Version the best. It talks about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. If you want to know if you're living in the world, John says these three areas are a great test to evaluate that. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. I heard a pastor years ago describe this as the desire to do, the desire to have, and the desire to be. And I've never forgotten that because I, I think that is such a powerful reminder of, of what this world offers us. The desire to do anything I want, the desire to have anything that I want, or anyone that I want, or the desire to be anything that I want. You need to hear this morning that there's nothing wrong with desire. Most desires are God-given. The desire to eat, the desire to drink, the desire to work, the desire to play, the desire to build, the desire to be intimate, the desire to achieve, the desire to conquer. All of those desires are God-given desires. What the world does is that it takes those desires and turns them around and perverts them in such a way that those desires become subhuman and contrary to what God created them to be. And, and you begin to see that. One of the things that he talks about here is, is this idea of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You can take that notion of lust and apply it to all three of those, to life, to what you see, to what you want to be. And lust isn't a bad thing, but the way it's used in Scripture is that lust is a compound word in Greek. And so the idea is that it's not only desire, it's hyper-desire. It's not only a desire to go and do this or be this. It's an intense desire that I'm going to sacrifice whatever I need to do. I'm willing to give up my testimony. I'm willing to give up my family. I'm willing to give up my job. I'm willing to do any of these things in order to achieve this. That's the kind of lust that John is talking about. That word flesh, the lust of the flesh, really is a reference to our sensual desires or what you and I might call pleasure. John is saying that the, the lust of the flesh is this idea that there are going to be things in our life that we really appreciate. I, I'm thankful that God gave us taste buds. I'm thankful that God gave us nerve endings. I'm thankful that you and I are able to experience pleasure in this life. Bite into a warm homemade cookie. That's pleasurable, isn't it? <laughs> Guzzle a Gatorade after you work out. 
Run your hand across the surface of a, a newly finished piece of furniture. Get a hug from your grandma or a pat on the back from a friend or kiss the lips of someone you're crazy about. I mean, those are, those are good things that God has given to us. And there's nothing wrong with them in the way that God designed them to be. And yet the world takes those desires and twists them into something that God never intended. When the pursuit of those desires overtakes our pursuit of God, then you can rest assured that the world has got its hands on you. Adrian, what do you mean? What I mean is that there are a lot of people who will willingly sacrifice things. Could be family, could be a relationship, could be their faith, could be their health. It's one thing to eat. It's an entirely different thing to eat too much. It's one thing to drink. It's an entirely different thing to drink too much to where you alter who you are and how you interact with people. It's a desire to want to be intimate with someone. It's too much when that desire causes you to make horrible mistakes that jeopardize your family or your relationships with others. There's a good desire to work, but it's a problem when it overtakes your life. There's a desire to, to want to be successful, but to be successful at all costs to where you're stepping on people and taking advantage of them. Do you see the problems that it creates? That's what John's getting at. That's the lust of the flesh. He then talks about the lust of, of the eyes, the, the, the desire to have. This isn't a desire towards sensation or experience. This is a desire towards things. That if I will get things in my life, if I will just have this, it's a desire for possessions. The Bible never condemns anyone for wanting things in their life. The Bible never has harsh things to say towards people who desire things in their life. What the Bible does have harsh things to say is that when you are prepared to spend reckless amounts of money, when you are prepared to do whatever it is you need to do to get whatever it is that you want, that's a problem. Sometimes it's cheating people. Sometimes it's stealing. Sometimes it's lying. Sometimes it's taking advantage of others. Sometimes it's not working the hours you said you worked in order to get whatever it is that you want. For many people, the desire of having it, whatever it is, is far stronger than their desire for God. John says when, that, when that's you, you can rest assured that you're loving the world. He then talks about the, the pride of life, this idea that God has placed within us a, a desire to pursue excellence and accomplishment. No one wants to be accused of, of not doing things well. I mean, the last thing I want to hear when I walk out of here this morning is for you to come up and say, you know, that sermon, there's excellence and here's where you were today. I mean, no one wants to do that. And for those of you who are already thinking that you're going to say it, I'm on to you. But that's, no one wants to hear that. No one wants to hear. If you are a master builder, no one wants to go up and look at the house that you just built and say, eh, the property brothers do it better. I mean, no one, no one wants to hear that. Or is that a fixer upper? Oh no, wait a minute. That was your actual work. I'm sorry. I mean, no one wants that. God has put in our desire things to be excellent and, and to be good. But when we find our worth in them, when we begin to measure our status by the things we do, John says you can rest assured that you're loving the world because your worth, your value is not measured by what you do for this world. It's measured by the love that God has for you and what he's demonstrated for you. Look at what he says in verse 17. We're going to finish with this. The world and its desires pass away, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. What is John saying there? The problem with pleasure, the problem with possessions, the problem with status is that they're never enough. And not only are they never enough, but they're shallow. You're going to one day find that, that pleasure isn't everything that it's cracked up to be. You're going to discover that one day material possessions go away and are, are not in style anymore and are going to end up in the, the junkyard or end up at a, at a Goodwill store. You're going to discover one day that the status and the awards and all the things you acquired, no one cares about. And, and John is saying, you need to understand that those things are going to pass away. There's nothing wrong with them, inherently wrong with them, other than when they become the main focus of your life. John says they're not going to last. 
I don't know that people look for pleasure so much as they look for joy. And they try to find that in pleasure. I don't know that people look so much for more stuff as much as they're looking for contentment in their lives. And they try to fill that with stuff. I, I don't know if people are looking for so much of achievement as much as they're looking for significance in life. In order to be significant, they're going to try and fill their lives with just doing more stuff. According to, to C.S. Lewis, these, these three desires that we have, the desire to do, the desire to have, and, and the desire to be, are, are so intertwined with what it means to be human. human. And C.S. Lewis describes it as, as what they are as evidence of a deeper rumbling in our heart. This desire that we have for something or someone more. In fact, C.S. Lewis couldn't even find a word to describe it. Sometimes he described it as joy. Sometimes he described it as light. But he describes it as, as wanting a relationship with someone for, for whom our hearts aren't going to rest until we have it. Or longing for a country that we haven't seen and yet we know it's there. I think one of the things that John is, is getting at is, is if we're living on the surface, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, those things are just indicative of a deeper desire. And you and I are, are faced with a choice in this life. We can, we can pour ourselves into those things, we can strive to live for those things, or we can take a step back and recognize that the lust of the flesh is, is fine in the context that God created it. The, the, the pleasures in this world are fine in the context that God created it. The, the eyes, what we see, possessions are fine in the context that God created it. Life is fine in the context that God created it. But our desire, our desire should be for God. I don't know where you are this morning, but I, I do want to leave you with what John says. He says, the world and its desires are passing away but the one who does the will of God lives. Lives. The one who does the will of God lives. Guys, you can rest assured that you know you're hungry for God when your desire for him is stronger than your desire for the things of this world. Because John says they're passing away. They're going to go. So this morning, where, where are you? What are you pursuing? What are you hungry for? Can you love the world and love God? Absolutely. Can you be in love with the things of the world and love God? John says, not so much. I'm going to invite you to pray with me. Father, I thank you for your word this morning and for how it speaks to us. I thank you for its power to open our eyes to life that, that is truly life. Lord, it is so easy, it's so easy, Father, to, to get caught up in, in the things of this world. And Father, to make this life about filling our hearts with the things that we think bring joy and happiness. And yet, God, I, I believe every one of us would admit that there, there is something within us that realizes that there's more to what than what this world offers. I think every one of us recognize that, that no matter how good life is, there still is something else that either we have found and it has brought meaning to our life or there is something else and we just haven't found it yet, but we know it's out there. Or John helps us to, to understand that in life we, we make decisions every day. And one of the most important decisions we can ever make is is where we were putting our heart. What are we putting our heart in? God, I, I pray for those this morning that are pursuing God. Whether they are young children, whether they are young men, whether they are older men, Father, those different stages that are represented, I, I pray that you would find people who are pursuing you above everything else. I pray this morning for those that do not know you, who came to this place today, maybe with an invitation to be here, and yet, Father, they're, they're finding their heart being open to you. 
they recognize that this life and, and what it has given to them hasn't fulfilled their deepest desires. And Lord, I, I pray that we would hear your word that, that the world and its desires are going to pass away. But the one who pursues you, the one who follows you is going to live. So Father, as you speak to us this morning, we're here. I do lift up those that, that need you today which is all of us. So God, thank you for finding us where we are. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for offering your salvation to us. And Lord, we pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I want to invite our worship team to come up as we close out our service together this morning. So much of what we've been talking about the last three weeks, and including this week, is, is being hungry for God. And I, I don't know if, if our conversations over the last few weeks have, have left you with a deeper desire for the Lord. I don't know if, if you're finding your heart being pulled closer to God or being challenged to walk more with the Lord. I, I, I don't know where many of you are. The, the, the beautiful thing about our Creator is that there is, is one who knows you better than you know yourself. And, it, and in, as much as I could encourage you in this time to let your heart be open to whatever it is that you need, there may be needs in your life that you are even unaware of. And you, you find the Lord speaking to you and reminding you of not only how much you were loved, but His plans for you. And those plans are good. Those, those plans are right. If you're here today and you want someone to pray with you about that, I would love the opportunity to. I'll be right over here. If there's people here that you feel more close to and you want to pray with, I, I hope you'd feel the freedom in this time to find those people that you know, to find those people that you see Christ in and just ask them to, to lift you up. As the Lord speaks this morning, May we be receptive to what he's saying to each of us. I'm going to invite you to stand and let's sing together. Take these hands and lift them up For I have not the strength to praise you near enough See, I am nothing, I am nothing without you. And take my voice and pour it out. Let it sing the songs of mercy I have found. For I have nothing, I have nothing without you. It's all my soul needs is for your love to cover. I have nothing without you. Take my body, take my body, and build it up. May it be broken as an offering of love. For I have nothing. I have nothing without you. So my soul needs for your love to cover.
time. Well, take my time here on this earth and let it glorify all that you are worth. For I am nothing, I am nothing without you. I want to invite Jason Kelhoffer to come and give us our benediction this morning. Don't forget, very important meeting tonight at 7 o'clock. Hope you can come back and, and join us. Jason. So I want to get uh, personal for a moment and tell you about a desire of mine uh, that was pretty strong. 1988 Diamondback Mongoose BMX. <laughs> Let me tell you. If I showed you a picture of this thing, it would probably burn your eyes out. It was just a thing of beauty. When I was uh, probably around 13 at that time, I was spending the summer with my cousin, uh, and BMXing was huge at the time. You know, you'd go to these tracks and and you'd race. There was even a track that you know, like people had to be sponsored and everything. It was it was our life. And uh, I grew up uh, in an area where we just, I, hunting, fishing, and we were in the country, and there was nowhere to ride bikes, so I didn't even have a bike. But over at my cousin's, I'd use my younger, my younger cousin, Jenny's bike. And it was a strawberry shortcake huffy. <laughs> I would, you know, it had tassels. I would, type, t t I would tape the tassels up. And I even bought, like, you know, the little Velcro thing that goes on a bike to, to cover it, make it soft, a little thing that said BMX to try and cover that up. And I wanted nothing more than a mongoose diamondback, because that was the bike to have. And I wanted that thing so bad. I was over at a buddy's house, and I was bemoaning my, you know, lack of having this thing. And he said, you know, I've got that bike. It's in my, uh, in my barn, actually, uh, but I can't ride it. Do you, do you want to borrow it for a while? What? So I take this thing, and let me tell you, I was so excited. I, I had spent, honestly, I can't tell you the desire I had to get this thing. So I went to the races, and failed horribly. And I had always done well before. And it was, I, I, I don't know, couldn't ride this thing. It was horrible. I later uh, went back to the Huffy and did, did quite well. I also found out that uh, the reason my buddy couldn't ride it uh, was because he'd stolen it. And uh, so then I ended up getting accused of stealing this bike and turned into a whole thing, ruined my friendship with the guy and, and, and all this stuff. And here's the thing that, that, that I come away with that. I spend even today seeing things, and I go, yeah, that's a Diamondback Mongoose. It looks good, but man, I've been down that road. And the thing I learned about desires is, is, you know, it really makes you fail to appreciate the things that you actually have. I later learned on that, that that Huffy, it was a girl's bike, and it was so light, and that's why I did so well with it. And it, it satisfied every need I had. It's just I was embarrassed about it. And how often do we have Christ who gives us everything we need, but there's just that little bit of embarrassment because the world says, you know, there's something better out there. Amen. Amen. So I leave you with this thought. Lord, give us the strength to appreciate the things we need. Amen, church? Amen. All right.